After a successful Chandrayaan mission, ISRO is all geared up for a solar mission, the Aditya L1 mission, and one of the principal payloads has been uh, designed from the Indian Institute of Astrophysics here in Bengaluru. And the man behind it, Professor Ramesh, is with me. Sir, uh, it's a crucial project. Uh, can you tell us the principal payload, the visible line emission coronagraph? What does it essentially do, sir? What's the aim? Aditya L1, this mission, is the first Indian space mission to study the sun. This mission has got totally seven payloads, of which the primary payload is the visible emission line coronagraph, which was designed and developed in-house in the Indian Institute of Astrophysics in its crest campus in Oskote, with support from various centers in ISRO. Now, Indian Institute of Astrophysics has got a long tradition of observing the solar corona during the total solar eclipses. In fact, the earliest observations for which the archival data is available date back to, dates back to 1898 when there was a total solar eclipse in Rajasthan in India. Mm. So it's almost 125 years. So the data collected over several eclipse expeditions have clearly indicated that it is very, very essential to study the outermost atmosphere of the sun. The sun has got three atmospheres, three regions. One is the visible disk that you are seeing whenever you look up at the daytime sky, that is called the photosphere. Then above that there is another shell which is called the chromosphere, which is a narrow layer of approximately few thousand kilometers in extent. Then beyond that we have the solar corona. Now during a total solar eclipse, the moon comes in between the earth and the sun. And the moon exactly blocks the bright light coming from the photosphere. This provides an opportunity to study the solar corona which is million times fainter as far as the light is concerned as compared to the solar photosphere. But the naturally occurring phenomena like a total solar eclipse can happen only twice or thrice a year. It can happen in any part of the world. And we all know that the totality duration lasts for only a few minutes. There are several observational evidences which clearly indicate that the sun needs to be monitored on a 24 by 7 basis. While observations of the sun or its outer atmosphere can be carried out with the ground-based facilities also, any ground-based telescope has got only limited duration of observation during the daytime because of the dawn to dusk cycle. So when the sun rises above the east horizon, you start your observation and it is about to set below the west horizon, you stop the observation. So you have a problem as far as the uninterrupted observations of concern with the ground-based facilities. The other key point which hampers observations with any ground-based facilities, be it the star observations or be it the sun observations, is the dust particles present in this atmosphere, it scatters the faint light that is coming from these cosmic bodies. So it is very essential that you need to go to a place where dust-free observations are permissible at the same time, 24 by 7 observations are permissible and space is the only possibility for that. Around 2012-2013, there was an announcement of opportunity from ISRO where they were asking proposals from the solar physics within the country to be launched uh, for observations from this L1 point. When you say L1 point, if you consider the Sun-Earth system as two massive bodies in the planetary system, solar system, there are five vantage points in this system where the gravitational force of attraction between these two bodies are perfectly balanced. Mm. These five points are called as the Lagrangian points because they were first invented or discovered by the Italian astronomer called Joseph Lagrange. Of this, the Lagrangian point L1 is between the Sun and the Earth in a straight line. So if you are going to keep a telescope with the Lagrangian L1 point, it's a gravitationally stable point from where you can have 24 hours uninterrupted view of the Sun. And secondly, since you are going to go well above this atmosphere, any scattering which is uh, happening in the case of the ground-based observations, that's also taken mm -hmm. care of. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons why the whole mission was designed. Now coming to the point why you need to observe the sun on a 24 by 7 basis. We all know well that some of the uh, most notable structures on the surface of the sun are called the dark regions called the sunspots. Mm -hmm. These regions appear dark in color because they are regions of stronger magnetic field compared to the ambient, mm. that little light is emanating from the regions as compared to the surrounding regions. Now these sunspots can be 
sort of, they are analogous to the Bohr magnets, which uh, we have studied in our high school classes mm -hmm. and things like that. Whenever we talk about a Bohr magnet, then you can imagine it has got a North Pole, it has got a South Pole, yes. then you have got the magnetic field starting from mm -hmm. the North Pole ending in the South Pole and all. And also we have experienced that when you try to bring close to each other two mm -hmm. Bohr magnets at the same polarity, they will ripple each other. But in astrophysical situation, it is totally different. Mm -hmm. You have a sunspot on the surface of the sun. It has got a north pole and a south pole. By the side of it, a new sunspot can emerge mm. with the same polarity. Now what's happening here is, because of the tension in the magnetic fields of lines emanating from these two sunspots, it can so happen the magnetic field line emerging from the north pole of the sunspot one, which is supposed to go to the south pole of sunspot one, mm can break open and go and join the south pole of sunspot 2 mm. and vice versa. Mm. So you have a situation here where there is a fraction of time where the magnetic field lines are altered and they are reconnecting again. Mm. Now these magnetic field lines are the locations where charged particles are stored. Mm. Like how uh, when your water pipe is broken, yeah. water gushes out without any control, when these magnetic field lines open and then reconnect again, in the fraction of a second, the energetic particles can be thrown out. Mm. Now, these sunspots, they follow what is known as a sunspot cycle. That is the number of sunspots on the surface of the sun. At certain times during 11 year cycle, they are the maximum and certain times they are the minimum. This is called sunspot cycle. So, when a sunspot is found on the surface of the sun, when a new sunspot is emerging by the side of an existing sunspot, when they are going to reconnect and throw these charged particles into the interplanetary space is something which is not known. Mm -hmm. So, which is very essential, you need to observe these things on a 24 by 7 basis. Mm -hmm. okay. When I talk about this expulsion of these charged particles, which in scientific terms we call as the coronal mass ejections, the mm -hmm. CMEs. The CMEs, they carry a mass of billions of tons of coronal material. To be precise, they carry 10 power 15 grams of coronal material. Mm. And they can travel at speeds which can go up to 3000 kilometers per second. And also they carry an energy of approximately 10 power 30 x. Mm. So these coronal mass ejections or the material expulsions from the solar atmosphere can go into any direction in the interplanetary space. Mm. They can also travel along the sun earth line towards the earth. Mm. Now in this situation, let us visualize a scenario where there is a satellite in the line of sight. Mm. When I mention a satellite, our day-to-day -day life these days depends very much on the satellite. Yes. Be it your internet, be it your TV, cricket matches, movies, or your cell phone connectivity, or your global positioning mm. system, all these things. So when these charged particle cloud, mm. they come towards the earth. Mm. It is like uh, when you disturb a beehive, you have a swarm of bees. Yes. So this charged particle cloud can engulf the satellite. When they engulf the satellite, per se, it may not create a physical damage to the satellite. But all the electronics on board the satellite can malfunction. Mm -hmm. Also, the sun shield panels which are extending out into the space, using which the satellites derive their power, mm -hmm. they can malfunction. So you have a situation where there is a socio-economic loss. Yeah. Secondly, let us consider another situation where there is no satellite in the line of the site. Mm -hmm. This charged particle cloud can come all the way up to the Earth. Mm. Earth, as we know, it is a very big mag magnet yeah. with a North Pole and a South Pole. Mm. You have the magnetic field lines emanating from the North Pole ending in the South Pole. It's like a cocoon inside which we are yeah. there. Now, this charged particle cloud, which is coming towards the Earth, can stream along these magnetic field lines. Mm. When they stream along the magnetic field lines, the Earth's magnetic field, which you call as the geomagnetic field, gets disturbed because of which the underground pipelines or the high voltage transformers, all these things can be affected. For example, in 1989, mm -hmm. when there was one, a massive eruption in the solar atmosphere, Quebec in Canada went out of power for almost 72 hours. Mm -hmm. And as recently as 2017, the Zurich airport in Switzerland, mm -hmm. it was almost locked down for 15 hours of day because of the CMEs. Mm -hmm. So now we have a scenario where there can be violent expulsions from the solar atmosphere, there is a possibility that they can travel along the sun earth line towards the earth and if there happens to be a satellite, the satellite can be damaged, it can malfunction and also the near earth space can be disturbed. Mm. This field of study we call as the space weather. Mm. So the space 
weather need to be monitored on a 24 by 7 basis mm. now the source region or the primary cause of all these violent eruptions in the solar atmosphere or the changes in the magnetic field configuration mm. so we have now two instruments on board this VLC one is called a coronagraph an imaging mm. instrument which takes pictures of the corona every one minute mm. so effectively we will be able to generate 1440 images per day mm. now though there had been missions by ESA and NASA in the past to study these features particularly from this Lagrangian L1 point mm. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the solar corona starts from the place where the solar photosphere, the visible disk ends. Yeah. In the case of a naturally occurring total solar eclipse, the moon exactly covers the photosphere and we are able to observe the solar corona right from the place where it starts. Yeah. Whereas when we try to do it artificially, mm. we have to put an occulting disk which blocks the bright light coming from the photosphere. Mm. the size of the occulting disk is very very crucial whether it is going to be of the same size as the photosphere or it is going to be bigger there are some practical issues because of which the size of the occulting disk that was used in the NASA ESA mission which was bigger than the size of the photosphere okay. so they were not able to observe they were not in a position to observe the corona right from the place where it starts hmm. that is at the boundary of the photosphere hmm. now when I talked about the coronal mass ejections the genesis or the birthplace of these coronal mass ejections are from the place where the corona starts okay. so it is very very essential that you need to observe the corona in the solar atmosphere mm. from the place where it starts mm. that is the edge of the visible disk of the sun with the VLC we will be able to go very close mm. as compared to the previous uh, coronagraph missions by ESA and NASA mm. and secondly With the v and again as compared to the previous ESA and NASA missions where they were able to take one image every 15 minutes mm. and all here we will be able to take images of the solar corona minute by minute basis okay. so any fast changes in time we will be able to capture it very effectively mm. and we are also flying a instrument called polarimeter mm. which is going to monitor this magnetic field changes mm. so whenever there is a magnetic field change it sort of gives a forewarning that that is going to be an eruption of the solar atmosphere. Mm. So these two unique capabilities of VLC is something which we will be doing it for the first time. Mm. Or some, so the solar physicists all over the world mm. are eagerly looking forward to the data that is going to come from this VLC mm. which is now scheduled for launch this coming Saturday at 11.50 yeah. from Shihiri Kota. But please keep in mind there is a cruise phase of 100 plus days yes. before we reach the Lagrangian L1 point. Mm. So effectively the real time observations of the solar atmosphere can happen sometime towards the mid-January. That's yeah. the hopeful scenario. Yeah.